So hello and welcome to episode four of the Surgical Discussions with Johnny and Ed. Um, I'm Ed. And I'm Johnny. And during this podcast, we're going to talk a little bit about gallstone and biliary disorders. Um, so what we're going to cover, we're going to talk, as always, about the relevant anatomy for this topic. We're then going to talk about gallstones, what they are, risk factors, how they come about, talk about some of the types of gallbladders, and then spend the rest of the podcast, um, and that's, this is going to make up actually most of it, talking about um, the important complications of gallstones. I'm going to hand over to Johnny now to talk about the anatomy. Okay, well, the function of the gallbladder is to concentrate bile and act as a reservoir for it. So it's found in the midclavicular line at the costal margin, and it lies in the fossa between the right and the quadrate lobes of the liver. What are the other lobes? The chordate and the left lobe, I believe. Okay. Okay, the parts of it are the fundus, the body and the neck. Um, there's also a mucosa made of columnar cells and mucous glands. Um, the biliary tract starts with the right and left hepatic duct, which you can see on the diagram here, and joining that is the cystic duct from the gallbladder, which joins to form the common bile duct, which runs down to the second part of the duodenum, uh, joining with the pancreatic duct in most people. Yeah, and then there's a there's a um, in a, in a few people it opens directly into the duodenum in a separate orifice, but that's quite right. And entering the duodenum at the ampulla of Vata, or uh, Vata, Vata, if you want. Yeah, I like to pronounce it Vata. Okay, you're probably right. <laughs> um, where there's the sphincter of Oddi. Okay. The vascular supply. If yeah. That's okay. That's yeah. Go for uh, it. Arterial supply is via the cystic artery, which comes from the right hepatic artery, yep. part of the celiac trunk. And the venous drainage is directly to the sinusoids of the liver. Brilliant. And I think that's about as much as you need to know. Okay. So, I'm now going to talk about gallstones in general. And there's a nice picture there of a excised gallbladder full of gallstones. They look like mixed gallstones. Yeah. Mixed gallstones. So, defining gallstones. Gallstones are, as you'd expect, stones that form within the biliary system. The important epidemiology principles are that the incidence of gallstones has been increasing recently. They're more common in women. 15% uh, of people over the age of 60 will have gallstones. However, it's important to remember that a majority of these um, will remain totally asymptomatic. Um, contrary to the well-known five Fs, Actually, gallstones are more common in um, blacks and Asians. Mm -hmm. So, etiology. Um, there are many theories about etiology. Um, the most important one to know and understand um, is that it's thought that gallstones form because bile becomes supersaturated with cholesterol, and therefore the cholesterol and bile will precipitate out to form um, stones. And there's a triangle, isn't there, Johnny? Yep, there's Amaran's triangle. Okay, what's, basically, what's that? That is, it shows that with an increase in the percentage of bile salts mm -hmm. and uh, phospholipids, yep. there is a decrease in the percentage of cholesterol. Yeah. So there's less chance of forming uh, glue stones. Yeah, that's basically it. Um, the other etiologies that are important are, or have been thought to be important include biliary tree sepsis, um, the secretion of possibly uh, lithogenic bile, and various anatomical abnormalities or congenital anatomical abnormalities in the gallbladder as well as epithelial abnormalities. But the most important one to remember I think is that um, it's thought the bile becomes supersaturated with yeah. cholesterol. Mm -hmm. So risk factors. Traditionally there are the five F's risk factors, fat, faulty, female, fertile, and fair. But as we've already said, um, not all patients with gallstones obviously satisfy these, particularly the fair um, criteria. That's not entirely true. Um, so instead, we like to divide the risk factors, um, as we've done before, into lifestyle things and other conditions and drugs. So lifestyle things include a diet that's high in fat or cholesterol, 
Um, other conditions include obesity, hemolytic states, particularly in association with pigment gallstones, and loss of the terminal ileum, say in Crohn's disease. An important drug to remember is the combined oral contraceptive. And pregnancy. So there are three types of stone. Um, the most common type of stone is actually a mixed stone, and this accounts for about 80% of the stones found. The next most common type is the cholesterol, um, gallstone accounting for about 15%. These tend to be large stones and can be known as solitaires. Um, if you cut through them, they also appear faceted. What's that mean, faceted? Don't know. Just faceted, okay. Yeah. Oh, no. Something to mention in the exam, they appear faceted. Um, pigment gallstones account for about 5% and are associated, as we've already said, with hemolytic states. So, what complications do they cause? Okay, we can classify this into those in the gallbladder, you can see in the diagram, in the biliary tract and outside the biliary tract. Okay, so the first are complications affecting the gallbladder. Um, there's two main ones, biliary colic and acute cholecystitis, and three other ones which we'll mention briefly, a mucosal Mirizzi syndrome and carcinoma. So, biliary colic. Um, what is a colic, Ed? A colic is um, a pain due to contraction of a hollow viscous. Yeah, with an obstruction. With an obstruction, yeah. Okay, so this is the commonest problem, and there's a blockage in the cystic duct. Which is the bit leading out of the gallbladder. From the gallbladder and joining with the hepatic duct. Okay. Okay, so symptoms are right, right upper quadrant pain, especially after fatty meals, which can radiate to the epigastrium and to the tip of the scapula via T7 to T9 fibres. Okay, and what about associations? There are some associations with that as well, aren't there? Uh, yep, there's often sweating, uh, nausea, and uh, dyspepsia, occasionally vomiting. Occasionally vomiting, okay. And on examination, you might find mild right upper quadrant tenderness. Okay, and what about that thing, Murphy's sign? Um, possibly, but more in acute cholecystitis, and we'll come on to that later. Okay. Okay, um, it's not a true colic, uh, which normally is an intermittent pain which rises and falls, um, but biliary colic rises and then there's a plateau period where it's stable, constant pain, which is often for up to hours, and then it falls. Okay, cool. And there's another diagram here just showing um, how the gallbladder is contracting against a, a blockage. Um, actually, this one's in the Hartman's pouch, but um, it may also be in the cystic duct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the acute cholecystitis is an obstruction of the gallbladder, as we've mentioned before, um, but with an infection superimposed on top of it. So the main thing is that the patient will be more unwell, and so the pain will be more severe, more constant, once again in the same place and with the same radiations, so to the tip of the scapula and the epigastrium, they'll be systemically unwell with a low-grade pyrexia, and possibly they'll have more vomiting and nausea. Okay. And then signs would be increased tenderness yep. and a positive Murphy's sign. Aha, so Murphy's sign. Now, Murphy's sign. Um, this is when you're palpating the gallbladder, which is in the midclavicular line at the costal margin. Yeah, you said that already. I know, I was just reiterating the Recaps point. Recap's important. Yeah. Anyway, go on. Okay, so when you palpate that, and you ask the patient to inspire, the gallbladder will press on your fingers, causing increased pain, and that will cause a cessation in inspiration. Okay. But you've got to remember that it's got to be negative on the left. Right, okay, so, so what's another cause um, that would cause you know, that kind of similar picture, I and mean, the reason that it needs to be negative on the left? Something like, I don't know, peritonitis? Yeah, and any other gastrointestinal problem, really. Any generalised GI yeah. problem. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But it's a, remember, it's only positive in three quarters, 75%. Okay. So not, not, a, not an, 
not a diagnostic, diagnostic sign, but helpful, but useful if it's positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Once again, if we investigate, we do blood cultures, and um, in the urine, we may find um, a rise in urobilirubin. Yeah. Why? Why? Why would you find that? Um, possibly because of obstruction. Yep. Uh, in the blood, arterial blood gas is not that helpful in this no. case. Um, venous blood, um, a raised white cell count, and CRP in um, cholecystitis. Mm -hmm. um, deranged use and ease if they've been vomiting. Yep. Uh, amylase, obviously, to exclude pancreatitis. Yep. And um, deranged LFTs. Okay, I mean, we wouldn't probably be expecting deranged LFTs in this situation because, as we said, the, the stone is impacted within the gallbladder, cystic duct, with, and there might be um, infection around that. What we're thinking about with LFTs is more when we go on to talk about where the gallstone gets stuck within the biliary system, yeah. but it's important to exclude this being present. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is amylase. Always remember amylase. It's necessary to exclude pancreatitis in any acute abdomen. So, Imogen. Okay. Um, first things are an abdominal x-ray, but remembering that um, only 10 to 15 percent of stones are radio-opaque. Yep. And also um, an erect chest x-ray to exclude uh, perforation, which is obviously a very serious complication. That's not good. And how would we see perforation? What do you think to look uh, for? With free air under the diaphragm. Usually the right hemi-diaphragm, isn't it? Um, other things, move on to an abdominal ultrasound, and you're looking for three things here. You're looking for the gallstone itself, mm -hmm. a fluid around the sac from inflammation, yep. and from dilatation of the uh, biliary tract, so the ducts, greater than six millimeters. Uh, other imaging that you can do is an MRCP, which is a magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatography, okay. which is a non-invasive test, and we will talk about that bit later on. I'm going to try and talk, a little, talk about it a bit later on. Okay. And there's no real scopic or um, functional tests. No. Okay, so management of biliary colic and uh, cholecystitis are similar, but we'll do them slightly separately. So obviously exclude emergency, so um, perforation of pancreatitis. Mm -hmm. And with those, you treat them accordingly. Um, then you can do conservative treatment, so rehydration if they've been vomiting, nil by mouth, and analgesia um, using a opioid, uh, specifically pethidine. Otherwise, you can get a spasm of the sphincter of Odi, and you use that at 50 milligrams uh, every four hours, either orally or intramuscularly. Yeah, okay. Uh, then the surgical treatment, you can either do this um, emergency, so urgent cholecystectomy, yep. or um, elective. Um, you normally have to wait six to 12 weeks to allow inflammation to settle down. Okay. okay. Then you take it out. Yep. And you can do it like this, either laparoscopic, laparoscopically or an open approach. Okay. Management of cholecystitis is, once again, very similar, conservative with rehydration, analgesia. You have to add in antibiotics obviously as there's an infection so you use kefiroxim and metronidazole. Standard kind of surgical after stuff. Yep. yep. And then once again surgery which can either be open or, or laparoscopic and if it's emergency it's got to be done in under 72 hours and if it's elective once again wait for the inflammation to settle so 6 to 12 weeks. Okay. Okay over to you. Oh no. oh, no, you've got one more. Don't, don't get excited. Oh, it's, gonna, it's just going to have a little rest then, but go on. Okay, uh, complications are uh, recurrence leading to possibly chronic cholecystitis, mm -hmm. uh, perforation, as we've discussed before, with free air under the diaphragm, needing its own treatment, and uh, an empyema of the gallbladder. So there's pus in it, and you need to remove it or drain it. Yeah, and you drain it by putting a tube in, and that's called a cholecystostomy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, in fact, you're nowhere near. No, there's, You've there's got a three little more, bit more. Three more conditions to talk about. Okay, so there's the mucosal, which is just a large dilated um, gallbladder 
due to a blockage in the outflow, so either the neck or in the uh, cystic duct, and then you get a sterile collection of bile causing the enlargement of the gallbladder. Yeah. If this is a large enlargement, it might cause an obstructive jaundice, and these combined are called Maritzi syndrome. Yep. And finally, there's the rare um, gallbladder carcinoma, which may be either squamous or an adenocarcinoma. Yeah. I mean, we don't really know a lot about that, but I, I think it's important to mention because people who do get gallbladder carcinomas in almost 100% of cases have a positive history of gallstones. Yeah. Okay. Over to you. So I'm going to now talk about gallstones in the biliary tree. Um, as this diagram shows, there are kind of two areas that gallstones tend to get stuck and the conditions that they cause depend on these areas. So if they get stuck in the common bile duct, they cause an obstructive jaundice. And if there's superseding infection on this, it, this can then cause an ascending cholangitis. If they get stuck at the ampulla ovata, um, they can cause blockage of the outflow of the pancreatic duct, leading to increased pressure within the pancreas. And because the pancreas contains all those digestive trypsins and proteases and things, this, these, the cells can then rupture, leading to these things being released, and this can then cause pancreatitis. Um, we're not going to talk about pancreatitis in this podcast. No, in a week or so. In a week or so, we'll do that. Okay, so the first thing we said is if the stone gets stuck um, in the biliary tree, it can cause an obstructive jaundice. Um, and in an obstructive jaundice, you'd expect, or you should ask about, um, pale stools. What kind of food stuff would you say that looks like? Um, to someone them. told me this the other week. It's, if I had to choose one, um, apparently it's hummus. Yeah. So, pretty disgusting, really. But does it have the same consistency? I don't know. It will probably be like solid hummus. Uh, it's going to put me off hummus if we continue with this. No maybe, maybe continue. Okay. okay, let's move on to something a lot cheerier. Dark urine. Um, actually, no, it's not a lot more cheery because they say the dark urine is Coca-Cola coloured. No, so now we can't two drink things. Two things I like to have, we can't have now. Okay, never mind. Um, so dark urine, and the last thing is jaundice. However, this is, this is quite late. Um, and the best place to look for jaundice clinically, um, apart from obviously on the blood panel, um, is under the tongue. It shows up first there, um, before it does in the, in the eyes. So the most important thing when you find an obstructive jaundice pattern on your blood um, LFTs is to exclude cancer. And there are two specific types you want to think about. These are um, cancer of the pancreas, particularly cancer of the head of the pancreas, and phalangiocarcinoma. So now, ascending cholangitis. Just like acute cholecystitis was infection on top of biliary colic or impaction of gallstones, in this situation, we have obstruction within the common bile duct and superseding infection on top of that. And the symptoms are traditionally represented in Charcot's triad, which is combined of fever and rigors, jaundice and pain. When we think about the signs, we think about another eponymous law. This is Courvoisier's law. This says that in obstructive jaundice, if there is a palpable gallbladder, it is unlikely to be a stone. Um, and this is one of those situations where you want to think about cancer, particularly cancer of the head of the pancreas. So remember, when you're examining in this situation, if you can feel the gallbladder, um, think about that particular pathology. Investigations. This is pretty similar um, to what we said before, and I don't want to go through these investigations again. But notice at the bottom that in these obstructions and with these um, superseding infections, it's important to do scopic tests. And there are three particular scopic investigations that I want to talk about now. These are the ERCP, PTC, and MRCP. So, um, in ERCP, or endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, um, what we do is we put the patient under sedation, um, and we then image the pancreatic and bile ducts after injection of uh, contrast media via the ampulla ovata. And the way we get there um, is to pass a um, long endoscope, pass this down to the second part of the duodenum, if you remember where the ampulla ovata is, and then we inject dye. Um, and as you can see, that's shown in the diagram on the left. And then an example um, is shown on the right with the long snake-like tube going 
going down to the second part of the duodenum, and then dye, which you can see um, going through the pancreatic duct, up through the common bile duct, up into the liver, and you can also see outlined quite nicely the shape of the gallbladder mm -hmm. there as well. Um, however, ERCP is not only diagnostic, um, it's also um, therapeutic, and stones in the ducts can be removed, and stents can be placed to relieve any um, obstructions that may be caused by strictures. Important complications of ERCP to be aware of um, are acute pancreatitis um, and bleeding, particularly after um, cutting of the sphincter of Odi. So now PTC, which stands for percutaneous transhepatic cholangiopancreatography. In this technique, there is injection of contrast into the biliary system via a percutaneously placed needle inserted into an intrahepatic duct. This is usually a second line test and is performed where either ERCP has failed or is not possible. That's a good diagram. So. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Um, MRCP is the final um, scopic investigation that I'm going to talk about. Um, this is a non-invasive test that doesn't require um, any contrast. Um, it produces images of the pancreatico biliary ducts, um, and these are actually fairly similar to appearance in those obtained by the invasive methods we've already described, such as ERCP. Um, it's useful to confirm a diagnosis prior to ERCP and is particularly useful in patients with allergies to iodine-based contrast materials. And there's quite a nice picture there of a MRCP with a stone visible in the bile duct and quite a lot of dilatation as well. Actually, no, the stone's visible in the, um, in the gallbladder as well. It's quite nice. So, management. Um, this is the management particularly of um, ascending cholangitis. Once again, we split it up into conservative, medical, and surgical. Um, as before, conservative management involved administration of fluids, giving adequate analgesia, particularly pethidine, and keeping the patient nil by mouth. Um, medical treatment, you need antibiotics, as we said, because there's superimposing infection. However, it's important to include pseudomonas cover. So instead of using kefiroxim and metronidazole, um, as we did in acute cholecystitis, instead we use kef and gentamicin. There may also be coexistent liver failure um, with this condition, so it's important to treat this with, say, um, vitamin K, glucose if needed, um, etc. Um, surgical management involves the emergency procedure, and this is basically to remove the stone and to insert a T tube for drainage. Um, the emergency procedure can either be done in um, an open fashion or it can be done using a therapeutic ERCP. Um, and, this is and this is usually the treatment of choice in the elderly patient. The next phase is an elective cholecystectomy. It's usually done uh, about one week after stone removal. So this is a little diagram um, that just shows the T-tube um, in position in the common bile duct um, draining it. So, okay, so after stones in the gallbladder and the biliary tract, we get to gallstones which have moved to outside. So, there's only one thing we're going to cover here, and that's gallstone ileus, favourite of medical students. Yep, that's us. That is us. Hopefully not from that far, touch wood. That's Johnny's head, by the way. Okay, anyway, so that's when there's a large stone, normally, which fistulates into the first part of the duodenum. Yep. And often, well, if it does fistulate, causes a small bowel obstruction, which we can see in this abdominal radiograph, yep. with the uh, dilatation of the small bowel and the valvulate and eventates. We don't want to get too carried away with that. No, nope. we're, we're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. So, yeah. Okay. I think that is it. That is it. Um, so, in summary, in this podcast, we've talked about the important anatomy of the gallbladder. We've looked at some of the um, risk factors for the development of gallstones and 
the various theories that are around for why you get gallstones. We've looked at the three important types of gallstones. And then we spent some time considering um, the complications, whether they be within the gallbladder, in the biliary tract, or lastly, outside. Um, remember the important investigations, go through that kind of um, investigation algorithm that we use, um, and then think about the different managements and how you perhaps decide seeing a patient whether to go down one route or the other um, for a few situations. Um, so that completes this podcast. Thanks for listening. Um, it's goodbye from Ed. And goodbye from Johnny. See you soon.